Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm so happy to be here in Hong Kong. Uh, this week, I'm traveling uh, all over China, uh, meeting with developers, uh, technology companies, uh, and many other folks to talk about uh, open source software and interesting trends that we're seeing out there. Um, as you know, the, this week, we're going to be talking about cloud computing. Uh, CNCF uh, folks are here all week. Uh, we've got folks here who are working on our artificial intelligence uh, efforts and all kinds of things. Uh, and I thought I would start off by giving you a quick update on uh, what's going on at the Linux Foundation. Um, I, I assume everyone here has heard of Linux and the Linux Foundation, right? I thought so. So, you know, the amount of open source software continues to grow every single day. Uh, right now, I think on GitHub uh, or other code repositories like Git T, there are millions of open source uh, projects. Um, but those projects aren't all equal, right? There's a small set of really important open source projects, Linux, Kubernetes, things like that, uh, that everybody depends upon. And that's really the big focus of the Linux Foundation, is being the home to the world's most critical open source software. Today, the Linux Foundation has grown significantly. We have almost 400 employees with offices all over the world. And we're not just working on open source software at the Linux Foundation. We're working on a whole set of collaboration efforts around data, hardware, of course, open source, and also open standards. One of our fastest growing groups at the Linux Foundation is actually standards development work, working on standards like SPDX that helps us all come to a common definition of software packages so that we can better take inventory of all the open source that we use every day. It helps with uh, governance, it helps with security, and so forth. Our open hardware effort, the RISC-V Foundation, is the fastest growing semiconductor instruction set in the world. And one of our other fast growing areas is in open data sharing. Today we have a project called Overture Maps, uh, which is an effort that was started by Amazon, Microsoft, TomTom in Europe, uh, and uh, Meta to create the world's largest shared geospatial data set. That big data effort is freely available. The data has been normalized. They've created a metadata standard for it in order to use data, that data, to train many of the machine learning and large language models that are so talked about today. And so whether it's in open hardware, open standards, open data, or open source, the Linux Foundation continues to grow and expand. Our goal with all of the work that we do at the Linux Foundation is the same, to take a really good technology project and help society, whether it's a government, whether it's industry, whether it's just an individual user, to make something out of it, a, a product. Doesn't necessarily have to be a product, but uh, I wanted a word that started with a P, so I, I picked that. Um, those products are sold and create value. You know, uh, most of uh, the world runs on open source software. All major cloud providers are built on open source software, things like Kubernetes, right? All in mobile devices are, the vast majority use open source software. Uh, in particular, the Linux kernel is in every Android device that's out there. Organizations make money off of those projects, uh, products, and the money that they make pays for developers, developers at all the companies that depend on open source, fix that software. They make changes to it, they improve it based on their experience using it with their customers. They then submit changes back to the project. That begets better products, more profit, better project, more products, more products. That's what we try and do at the Linux Foundation. 
And we have a whole set of things that we do to facilitate this collective development. This is kind of what the Linux Foundation does. For the world's most important software, we are the people who facilitate the development. In fact, we have uh, almost 800,000 developers who work on Linux Foundation projects every single day, which kind of technically makes us the world's largest software company, but we don't really employ almost any of those developers. They work all over the world for different companies and organizations that depend on open source. What we do is all the stuff that you need to facilitate this great development. And it continues to grow. Year over year, our organization is growing at about 30% annually, and it's a testimony to how important open source software is. Whether it's in cybersecurity with our Open Source Security Foundation, uh, in networking, our open network automation platform is used to run mobile networks in Europe, the United States, and here in China. In film and television, our Academy Software Foundation is a set of open source projects that are used to create the CGI special effects you see in Star Wars movies and the Marvel films. And finally, uh, in, in the energy sector, we're working with grid operators around the world with open source software that they're using to, to modernize energy distribution. <laughs> Uh, which will, of course, help to lower the cost of energy and uh, help impact climate change. So every year, the organization continues to grow as open source continues to be a critical part of the entire uh, tech industry and all of our daily lives. But today, I thought I would give you a quick overview of some of the work that the Linux Foundation is doing in artificial intelligence. This week, as I've been traveling throughout China, the only thing people want to talk about is AI. It's uh, ever since uh, OpenAI and GPT uh, came out last year, uh, it's been this incredibly hot topic. Uh, and so I will also uh, address it here. And I thought I would start by talking about where there are some good opportunities for open source in the world of artificial intelligence, specifically in the world of large language models, frontier foundation models, and for uh, any application for artificial intelligence. And so one of the things that I think is important to understand before we talk about specific open source projects is uh, the AI stack, right? Most people who are interested in artificial intelligence are interested at the top level. Most people working in AI today are building AI applications that they use for their business or for uh, some product or service that they may offer. Uh, AI applications today are doing incredible things. Uh, just yesterday in Beijing, uh, I saw a, a talk from uh, Alibaba who uh, was creating an AI application for early detection of pancreatic cancer. Just really amazing work, an application that is already saving lives here in China by helping to detect pancreatic cancer as early as possible. So that's where most of the development is taking place. And you're gonna see lots of proprietary applications or open source applications. Uh, and you know, people who are building those apps can decide what kind of license they want to offer. But underneath those open source applications is a bunch of other things. Some of it is software, some of it is data, some of it is hardware. And so under those applications, you have fine-tuned specialized models. You have the Frontier Foundation models that you hear about, Mistral, GPT-4, uh, Llama-3, and so forth. We have closed and open APIs that people access to build applications. There are model hubs out there like Hugging Face. Uh, there are applications for AI safety that are helping us to address concerns about artificial intelligence. There's, of course, data that is used to build large language models. 
all of the tooling that you need to deploy and build these models uh, from an ML ops perspective. And then there's the clouds uh, that uh, are basically running uh, the, both the building and deployment of uh, AI applications, which of course also run on hardware and software themselves. I think in open source, there are a few really specific areas where there are opportunities uh, to take advantage of collective development. Uh, and these aren't all just about source code. First of all, in fine-tuned specialized models, I think this is an area where there's a real opportunity for people to collaborate on a set of standards that make it easier for enterprises to deploy RAG models and really deploy enter, uh, enterprise AI. In a couple minutes, I'm gonna talk about a new project at the Linux Foundation called OPIA that we're uh, working with industry on to make the development of fine-tuned specialized models and the deployment of AI easier. At the foundation model layer, we're already seeing incredible breakthroughs in open source with large language models. Models like Mistral and Llama 3 are really incredible cutting edge frontier foundation models that are rapidly catching up and in some cases surpassing uh, the leading front frontier foundation model, which is of course OpenAI's GPT-4. In the area of model hubs, Hugging Face is the clear leader here, and there's a whole ecosystem of open models that people can download and utilize to make AI applications. And in the area of AI safety, I think this is a particularly good opportunity for open source to address concerns around AI safety and co-develop tools and standards to help with uh, content authenticity and privacy to help fight deep fakes and fraud uh, and uh, root out model bias and things like that. Open source is particularly helpful in the area of AI safety because of the transparent nature of its development process. I'm gonna show you a project today at the Linux Foundation in AI safety uh, that we're also working on. In tooling and ML ops this week, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation is here, and while CNCF is called the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, it might as well also be called the ML Ops Foundation because all large language models and machine learning tools are deployed on cloud native infrastructure. This week, we've got a ton of great sessions on how cloud native tools are used to deploy AI applications, and you're gonna hear all about that this week. In the data side, I think this is probably one of the biggest both opportunities and challenges for the open world. As data becomes the building block for large language models, in the United States, we're already seeing companies cut off access for uh, the ability to crawl data. Uh, you see uh, a whole new world where Data is now being sold in order to train large language models, and it's only available to the people who have the most money to buy that data. I think there's an opportunity for us to also have an open alternative to closed data, but it's something that's going to create, require resources uh, and, and a very focused approach. Our Overture Maps effort is an early example of how that can be done. Then finally, on the hardware layer around cloud computing and software layer around cloud computing, I think the stuff's pretty open right now. Most cloud computing infrastructure runs on uh, tooling that comes out of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. But at the hardware layer, we're seeing market concentration, particularly around NVIDIA's CUDA API, right? CUDA is really the de facto standard uh, for accelerated workloads around AI. And I think there's an opportunity there for an abstraction API that both CUDA can consume and others that would make it easier for uh, developers to come to a common open accelerated API uh, that would work across multiple silicon architectures. 
I'm going to show you an effort the Linux Foundation's working on right now uh, in this specific area. So here are some of the things that the Linux Foundation is doing to address those opportunities. At the hardware API layer, we have the Unified Acceleration Foundation, the UXL Foundation. This is an effort uh, from semiconductor manufacturers, organizations that want to get together and create a common acceleration API that we can all consume in order to create more competition and an easier way for developers to create tools for uh, that hardware, um, it's a project that you should check out, UXL. Another effort that we have that is addressing things like AI safety is C2PA. C2PA is the Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity. This is a tool that provides for digital immutable watermarking technology from the content creator all the way down to the publisher. And so this is something that OpenAI is participating in, along with hundreds of other companies that want to make sure they respect content creators and have ways to track content authenticity. Today, when you use a Sony or a Leica camera, that C2PA standard is embedded right in the camera. The second you take the photo, that authenticity standard is implemented there and that will track and follow that image all the way through any editing, any training, to a final film or photo that if it has the C2PA mark on it, you know that that's the original content and you can see how that content has changed. I think in a world of generative AI, this is going to be deeply important to help us all understand what's real and what's AI. Of course, at the Linux Foundation, we also are home to the fundamental building blocks of large language models. PyTorch is really the de facto tool that is used to create ML and large language models, uh, and it's one of our fastest growing uh, projects. And then finally, our LFAI and big data effort is building a set of projects that allow you to have an open source implementation at every aspect of the machine learning and LLM production process. This is something that we thought was really important at the LF, AI, and big data effort, right? You know, the model itself is not the uh, only thing you need, right? If you wanna really take advantage of AI, you need all these different components in order to create an ML or LLM. And what we want to do is for each one of the steps in that process, have an open source project that enables it so that you can have end-to-end -end open source for every aspect of production. If, please go check out our LFAI and big data effort. There's folks here this week that'll be talking about it so that you can understand what each of these projects are and how you can take advantage of them. The other area I talked about was enterprise AI earlier. We launched this year a new project called OPIA. This is a framework for the management of AI systems in the enterprise that it sort of helps it become more efficient in terms of rolling out uh, ML and AI systems in your enterprise. Think of this as sort of the Kubernetes of uh, you know, uh, AI in the enterprise. Again, in this case, what we wanted to do was create an end-to-end -end open source reference implementation and set of APIs that everyone can utilize to make it much more efficient. If we all start using the OPIA framework, it will be much easier for you and everybody else to one, improve this platform, and two, get quickly to what you really want which is the actual AI application in your enterprise. Finally, and the last thing I wanna to talk to you all about is sort of stepping back and answering the question, what do we mean when we say open AI? So some people, when they say open AI, they mean the company open AI. When I say open AI, I mean uh, the, uh, 
open space AI. You know, what is the definition? What does it mean to be open in a world of large language models? And there's so many good folks who are working on developing a common understanding of what open AI means so that when you use a new large language model or you take advantage of machine learning technology, you know what's open, but you'll also know what might not be open. And the reason that's important is because it's much different than source code. I think there's some folks from OSI here this week. Stefano Mafuli is here, uh, the executive director of OSI. There he is in the back of the room. Um, OSI is working on a definition of open AI. And the Linux Foundation has also been working on a framework to help people understand what open AI means as well. You see, to create an LLM, you have to have all of these different components, and it's not just source code, right? And so what we created at the Linux Foundation is the Model Openness Framework. This is a way to help evaluate how open or not open a model is. And so this sort of allows people to grade, uh, based on all this complexity, how open a model is. You know, people always ask, like, is Llama 3 really open? Uh, is this particular model really open? Because, like, I don't get the data. I'm not sure, really sure how it was trained. And what our model open framework does is help answer those questions. And because there's so many moving parts in an LLM production and deployment, what we did was created a grading system, so to speak, to help understand what components are open and included in a model versus not. And so what we came uh, to consensus on was three different classes of openness. The highest level, level one, is an open science definition where the data and every component that was used and all of the instructions that uh, you need to actually go and create your own model the exact same way are included. In open tooling, it's a subset of that, where not all of the things are actually open, uh, but most of them are. And then on level three, you have areas where the data may not be available, but data cards that describe the data sets would be available, um, and you can kind of understand that even though the model is open, that not all of the data is available. So this is a great way for you to all take a risk-based approach, a more nuanced approach to understanding what is open and not. And one of the things that we also thought about was, let's go create an open source tool to help open source practitioners, or sorry, AI practitioners, uh, evaluate the openness of any particular model. So we have this uh, toolkit that you can go look at that helps you to judge the openness of a model. And it's a great way for you to figure out before you take a dependency on any kind of LLM uh, just how open it actually is. So these are just a small set of the efforts that are going on at the Linux Foundation in AI. And we're really happy to be working with so many developers in this incredible space. The last thing I want to leave you with is some events that are must-attend AI events for any of you who are interested in open source as it relates to AI. Our AI.dev event this week is happening here in Hong Kong, but we're also going to have a series of events uh, next year around AI dev, which we'll be announcing soon. Uh, next month in San Francisco, we have our PyTorch conference. This is an incredible conference where you can meet the actual developers who are building large language models, working on all of the tools that are used to create large language models in person in San Francisco. And then finally, uh, the KubeCon Cloud Native event in November is a must attend AI event. And some of you might ask, well, wait, isn't the Cloud Native event for cloud computing? Why is it a must attend AI event? And it's because most of the content this year at KubeCon is actually about how to use Kubernetes to deploy AI technology because it really is the de facto standard that everybody uses. I had a chance to look at all the talks that were submitted this year for KubeCon, and I think something like 30, 40% uh, are 
all, all about how to use Kubernetes and cloud native uh, architecture to deploy AI. So that's the stuff we're working on. We want to continue to work with this community. Take advantage this week of all the amazing content, the great developers are, that are here to learn about open source and how it relates to AI and cloud computing. And I want to wish you all a great event. Linus Torvalds is going to be here this week. We've got a ton of great content to come. And so please, please enjoy the event. Thank you very much.